Welcome to AOL. Welcome to AOL Underground. Would you please state your name and the years you worked at AOL? My name is Ersi Stern, and I worked at AOL from October 16th, 1995 until October 16th of 2007. That is exactly 12 years. That's great. When did you first use a computer? I first used a computer in the sixth grade in the library of my elementary school. It was an Apple IIe. That's great. I also started on the Apple. <laughs> What were you doing on the computer at that time in sixth grade? It was open for any student who wanted to use it. It really wasn't plugged into anything other than itself. There was no internet or ethernet or anything like that around. So those of us who who had the inkling were writing super, super simple basic scripts. You know, draw a circle, draw a square, print a smiley face, that sort of stuff. There was nothing terribly complicated going on. Although for us, it was terribly complicated. It was high tech. And then middle school, we had what they called patch PET computers, which were computers that the programming was recorded on audio cassette. So think about like Maxell cassette tapes. All of the programming was actually recorded onto the audio cassette. So you would write your program to the audio cassette, load the cassette into the playback deck, and play it back into the computer to get you know your rocket to take off or, or a mathematical program to, to run an equation. This was in math class with the pet computers. Um, and then I didn't actually have any computers in senior high. They didn't have any in the, in the, upper, in the upper high school. Interesting. Um, so then I didn't, yeah, I didn't get back to computers again until college. So then once you got to college, you revisited computers? Is yours your degree in computers? or? Yes, my, my degree is in computer science. I have a bachelor's in computer science actually went into computers because my mother was a biochemist and I thought biology was too easy. And she struggled with technology. And so I thought that if I got a degree in technology, I could help her. And if I ever needed anything, you know, if I ever needed anything biochemical, she could help me. No, I just, uh, I just, because I'd always grown up with her and, and her studying things biological and biochemical, it kind of, felt easy to me because I kind of learned it with her. Uh, we, She was in college when I was in high school and then she was in graduate school when I was in uh, you know, basic college. And so it was, we kind of went to school together for, throughout our lives. And so I kind of knew everything she was studying. So it seemed more challenging to me. And my uncle was a physicist. He was an honest to God rocket scientist at Lawrence Livermore. And so I was fascinated by the work he did and, and computer science seemed like the way to go as a different angle to get into physics and to get into rocket science. So you wanted to eventually go into physics and rocket science? I wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> I wanted to go to Mars. That was, that was honestly, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I was 18, I wanted to be the first woman on Mars. And so then you got your degree in computer science. And what was the atmosphere like then? Like, were there a lot, were there a lot of women in computer science or, or not? No. There were two women, myself and one other lady, in my graduating class in 1990. It was definitely a, a male-dominated career field. And unlike the career field of today, it was a very singular career field. You got a degree in computer science. You didn't get a degree in programming. You didn't get a degree in networking. You didn't get a degree in architecture. You got an engineering, a double E engineering degree, or you got a computer science CS degree. Uh, those were those are kind of your choices, and so it was. In some ways, I feel it was a little more well-rounded education because you had to do a little bit of everything. You know, we had to learn programming, we had to learn architecture, we had to learn networking, we had to learn all of those things to get our degree. Um, it was less specialized, but at the same time, the people who are coming out now get a very specialized degree, and they can walk in and. and do a very skilled job at a very specific thing. So it really depends on it, you know whether you want to be a specialist or a gen generalist, as one of my coworkers would, would describe it. And I feel very 
comfortable being a generalist, being the kind of person who could walk in and say, oh, you need something, you know, re-network? Sure, I can do that. Oh, you need something programmed? Sure, I can do that. Oh, you need something, um, you know, you need an operating system installed? Sure, I can do that. You know, just whatever it is you need, I can do it or I can read about it and I can fix it. But I think a lot of the people graduating in the last decade and, and especially now, if they don't have a focus in that, they really don't have the background to be able to just pick it up and run with it. Right. So are you saying that they taught you like subnetting and about networks and like TCP IP and things like that with your degree? Oh, yes. 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 I had networking. I had kernel level programming. I had circuit level design. I had pretty much everything. I mean, everything down to from circuit boards all the way up to, you know, what then was the, the highest level programming language that was being used, which was Pascal. Which you know these days would be you know C or Java or something like that, but that that was what was was being taught in the curriculum. You went from you know programming and binary all the way to you know developing web interface programs and things like that. Uh, it just really depended on where you wanted to take your your career. Ultimately, if you want, you could take more programming courses or you could take more engineering courses, but you had to take some of everything to get the degree. Got it. So how did you end up working at AOL? I, like I said, I got the job in 95, depending on how much history, you know, 95 was in the middle of the Gulf War. I was working right out of college for the government, for the defense department. And I was working on programs supporting the Gulf War. And I found myself frustrated and a little bothered by what was going on over there, the killing, and, and it wasn't, I didn't feel comfortable supporting it. And I wanted to look around, but working in the classified government facility, I had no access to be able to print resumes. And at home, we only had a dot matrix printer. And my husband was at AOL. And he said, you know, let's, let's print your resume up here. And so we did, but he forgot it, left it on the printer. And one of the managers at AOL wandered by the printer to get his own print job, picked it up, saw the last name, went over to my husband and said, is this, this guy your brother? The reason they said that is my name is spelled E-R-C-I, and a lot of people think that it's a typo for Eric. And he looked at George uh, and said, well, no, this would be Eric, my wife. <laughs> and so George said, well, is she looking for a job? And and he was like, well, yeah, it's a resume. <laughs> so I got a call. Um, and both him and Brian, who we spoke to before, uh, they both interviewed me and they both competed for me. <laughs> and I ended up working for George. But that's how I got there was uh, because my husband forgot my resume on the printer. <laughs> got it. So what was it like when you first started working at AOL? Like if you compare that to with the government and the Gulf War and stuff like that? Oh my goodness. I mean, it's a culture shock because it's, I mean, it feels like a family and a party atmosphere and a free for all. It feels like it's moving 10 times as fast as the government. In reality, it's not 10 times as fast, but it feels like it. Government procurement, government delivery of hardware, of software, of all of that moves at a very slow, very deliberate pace. At AOL, you could call Hewlett Packard on a Friday and on a Monday, you'd have a pallet of hardware and you'd have to put it someplace and get it plugged in and get it installed and get the operating system installed and all of that. Usually by the following Friday and you'd never have that kind of turnaround with the government. Um, so I had walked into a shop where I, you know, my previous job, I had been in a lot of hurry up and wait situations, which were real hurry up and wait, you know, we have to get this done. Oh, but you're not the right person. So you can't do it, even though I would ask to do it. And then I ended up in places where, at AOL, where they're like, okay, we have all of that over there. You see that, that stack of boxes, it's taller than you are. Put those in the rack over there on the right tomorrow or between now and tomorrow, you know. And, you know, get help if you need it, but that's what has to be done. And so you just worked until the job got done. That was expected of everybody. 
Um, it worked like a startup. It really did, even though it was growing constantly. It was in growth period between 95 and 2000, 2002, serious growth period. And But it had a, an internal feel of a startup, especially in the operations side, side of the house. It really felt like a startup. It was growing. It was evolving in in its evolution because of the way it was growing it would it, you know you'd be a, an operations team one month and then you would be the operations mail team for six months and then you'd be the operations inbound mail team and then you'd be the operations spam team and then you'd be, you know it would you'd continue to morph and and get a little tighter and your focus would get a little tighter with each modification you were still kind of under the same umbrella so you were still that same family but your focus would shift a little bit and so you could see the growth of the company, but still that overall feel was always fun. I mean, my I, a coworker and I would do an Easter egg hunt every year inside the building. We would get, you know, the plastic eggs and put chocolates or um, raffle tickets because they always had raffles at the company for different things, you know, for movie tickets, things like that. And we would just scatter them around the building. We'd put them in the data center data centers, they're plural. Um, we just, you know, we just do that. And then you know, people would throughout, you know, whatever day was closest to Easter, we'd just go finding Easter eggs. We would have Mardi Gras parties. We would have, you know, Halloween parties. We'd, you know, pick, pick your holiday, pick your reason. You know, we'd have uh, Diwali for the, the folks from India. We would have Jewish holidays. We'd have, like to pick your, pick your nationality or whatever. Um, we were extremely inclusive and, you know, give us a reason to eat, to party, to, to get together because tomorrow you might be working 12 hours. So, you know, if, if you can, if you can have some downtime on one day when you know you're going to work really hard the next day, it makes it fun. And that's what the government never was. And, and since has never been, um, I've never been at a, a government facility since that has been fun. So. Yeah, <laughs> that definitely makes sense. <laughs> you were talking about racking servers. So would you rack yep. them and set them up? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, if you were, uh, the first team I worked with was the, the web department. We were standing up the web servers. They were SGI. I can't remember the brand name specifically. They were like 2U, 3U servers. And we were standing these up, you know, a rack at a time, basically. And there were six of us on the team and any given moment, two or four of us would be in there, you know, racking them. And then another person would be back at their desk, desk doing pixie boots, uh, pushing out the operating system. Um, we had a, we had a, a pre-configured operating system and we just pushed the same operating system out to every one of the servers. And then after that, we'd make whatever specific modifications, you know, change the, HTTP site to the specific customer's information, uh, update the IP addresses, update you know any specific details necessary for the customer, and then push their per, the private site pages onto it. Um, but our initial configs were were pre-made and, and held on a back then it was SVN uh, subversion server. But yeah, we had kept everything there and used that to to push stuff out. So did you have like multiple? Were there multiple customers per host, or was it one customer per host, or how that worked? Uh, it was one customer per host. This was this was in the early days. This was we didn't start multi-homing web servers until probably the second or third year, because um, mostly, I mean, the clients were paying for a, a private server for the most part. We did a lot of multi-homing of internal stuff. Were you assigning like external IPs to each of the hosts, or? We had, uh, I mean, we had DMZs and stuff like that. So, you know, AOL was behind a DMZ and, and the, the term is escaping me now. Um, so it was like NADIT or something? Round Robin. You know, if you went to 1234, 1234 would hit the, the DNS Round Robin and it would determine which of the 25 web servers had the lightest load and would just go to that one. And then on the back end, we would keep those servers parallel. Um, so that's how it would load balance early, early on. And then of course, load balancing technology improved. And so we just keep improving the infrastructure behind the, the DMZ. So 
Um, but a lot of the a lot of the smaller website companies didn't pay for multiple web servers, so they just got one. Okay, that, that makes sense. So then, mm-hmm. what was the web server that was used back then? Was it Apache or? Well, we were using uh, Apache, and then when we purchased Netscape, we were using them. Oh, I didn't know Netscape had a server. That's interesting. It had some modified Apache version. It had a name, and I can't remember what it is now. But it was Netscape. It was a Netscape front end for the browser, because then we went and modified the name and called it AOL something. AOL, we called it AOL Server on the back end. Oh. So then we were replacing everything that was Apache with AOL Server. And the AOL Server was the what was the renamed Netscape? Was the modified Netscape a server? Yeah. Wow, that's really cool. I was, I was wondering how AOL Server came about. What did you think about AOL Server compared to Apache? I like Apache. I mean, I could still I could still do Apache in my sleep. So, <laughs> you know, and I, you know, I've always wanted to learn Nginx, but I've never had reason to. I've never had a customer who's ever wanted it because you know I think everybody knows Apache and everybody's comfortable with Apache. So, yeah, definitely. I, I think I made a switch from Apache to. Nginx, I don't know, like six or seven years ago. It they're both they're both pretty yeah. similar. I mean, the other day, uh, yeah, I, I suspect that. I've just like I said, I've never had a personal reason to. I don't run a website of my own anymore. So, I think you're talking before about was the food the, mm-hmm. the food network or there was you said there were some customers yeah. that had FTP we, servers, right? And I know, can you tell me about some of the challenges? I guess. Yes, um, several of the discovery services, so Food TV, HGTV, those two I remember specifically. They had web servers, and they they were the beginning and the bane of my security existence at the beginning of that evolution because they demanded uh, open anonymous FTP to the internet. We tried a lot repeatedly to dissuade them from using the open anonymous FTP. This is read and write, right? Mm-hmm. Both read and write. We said, you know, please ask your customers to at least log in. You know, we could, you can have them log in, you know, give them free, you know, they don't, they don't have to sign up very well, but they need them log in so that there's some accountability with, with what gets posted and they wouldn't, they wouldn't buy it. They wouldn't accept it. So we spent a lot of time chasing wares or wares, however you want to pronounce it, software. The food TV in particular was taken over multiple times by any time a new Microsoft product came out, any time a new Lotus Notes came out, any time a new game came out. Everybody and their brother was posting their ripped version to the anonymous FTP and then we're going into the chat rooms and saying, Hey, go get it here. And so we would just get swamped. And I was using one of the early generation security tools called Swatch, which was a a file watching file system, file watching tool. And it would tell me anytime files with certain attributes or names would show up in a file system. So if I had my FTP partition and I said, you know, tell me anytime Microsoft shows up here, I'd get a page. The big night that Microsoft launched a whole new version of its office suite, I received over 10,000 pages and was called numerous times by our network operating center because I crashed the pager system, literally took it offline. Because there was 10,000 files written? Well, the software was repetitive. I mean, it was, this was first generation alerting software. This wasn't the best. Um, but it kept repeating. It kept alerting me, oh. and I didn't get to it fast enough to to cut it off to to stop the alerts in time. So it had, it had sent out ten thousand messages, and it had gone ten thousand messages to the paging system, and the paging system had sent ten ten thousand messages to AT and T. And somewhere in the telephone Ethernet were ten thousand messages waiting to get to my pager. So it was. It was a very long night <laughs> waiting for, for all of those pages to get through. Um, but it was also a long night cleaning up those files and continuing to clean those files and trying to contact the customer to explain to them what was going on and why this was a bad idea. And, you know, they didn't want to be contacted in the middle of the night any more than we wanted to contact them in the middle of the night. 
And so it really became a, a game of whack-a-mole to, to constantly, the moment you saw something, just delete it. You know, just, just don't alert on it, just delete it. We may or may not have deleted customer files accidentally, but, you know, we, we had to basically, you know, write a policy for the customer that said, we can't be held responsible for files that may have a name or a profile that fits that which, you know, parallels illegal software. You know, we have to, we have to protect ourselves and in so doing protect you. And I think that may have begun part of the relationship killer that we had with discovery because not too long later, discovery went and started its own online service. Oh, interesting. So yeah, you configured Swatch with specific like regular expressions or strings that if it saw that file, it would delete it. And then did you have like eventually specific file types or something you would allow or you would like decompress stuff or what? Um, mostly, it, I mean, if it was mostly just file names, I mean, this, this was not terribly sophisticated to begin with. Um, you know, so if it, if it said Microsoft Office, if it said uh, Word, you know, Microsoft Word, the hard part with looking for file types is, you know, people were putting up recipes. So they're putting up Word files, they're putting up Excel documents, they're putting up things like that. So file types was, would be even more dangerous. If you just went and deleted every Word document, you'd, you'd end up, you know, killing two thirds of the customer content. So it was a lot of looking for, you know, zipped files or looking for RAR files or looking for things like that. Those were a lot more suspect than, you know, somebody's dot txt or dot wrd or dot, you know, whatever the extension is or doc or whatever the extension of the day was. So that would be, you know, it was, it was, it was very selective. And then we got some hardcore coders in the group and they started writing tools that were much more sophisticated than Swatch. I mean, Swatch was really, Swatch's real intent was just as a log, a log tracking tool. I was stretching it beyond its normal uh, functionality. So. Got it. So the folks uploading the uh, whereas, do they find did they start to notice this and start to name the files differently or anything? Or I don't think so. Um, partially because there were just enough different open and anonymous FTPs that they could just you know populate their software five or six different places and it didn't matter. And you know we didn't have a whole lot of control over our customers. You know we didn't have much ability to say you know thou shalt not have an open and anonymous FTP because that was the contract they signed with AOL. So, you know, oh. we were on the, the bottom of the totem pole when it came to this. It was like, you shall build a web server with an open and honest FTP because we signed this with Discovery and this is what they want. And we're like, oh, glad you asked. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Interesting. So you had to work within those parameters. Yes. Did you have any issues with malware on those? or? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, not that malware that was, you know, come get this malware it wasn't deployed into the servers. Oh, so but wasn't like, I don't know, muffins dot, 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 dot doc. It wasn't like people injecting worms. It was, yeah, it wasn't like people injecting worms and stuff. No, that was, that was all coming in people's emails. And, and, you know, that was infecting everybody's workstation. So that was a totally different problem. Got it. Okay. But mostly there, we were all using, um, Linux, well, Unix or Macintosh based workstations at our desks. So we didn't have a whole lot of problem at our desks. People who were having problems at their desks were the people in the, in the more office positions, the people at the more executive level, the people more at the corporate level. They were the ones using the PCs and the Macs day to day. So down in operations and engineering where we were, we didn't see a whole lot of that again because we were spending our time on pretty much 100 percent in unix right what kind of problems do they have oh they got all the the malware and the viruses and they got the worms and they got the the trojans and they got all that fun stuff but it was the the office uh, support team that dealt with them for the most part we didn't really have to got it so you were 
helping to keep up the production websites and yes i was i was in production yes and, and then then became the mail servers was it was that later or yeah my team started in web and then web and mail got merged together because they were both internet services and then they got separated apart again and then i siphoned through mail to security and then from security part became part of the test organization and within test became it was part of the test and security team doing information security while people were putting their code or their part portion of the service through test um so i think i, I had mentioned that we have this uh the service in production is broken down into things called pods. So the front end of the service, so where the customers connect and where all of that customer facing infrastructure, so all of the chat room infrastructure, all of the game infrastructure, all of the web interface infrastructure, all of that sits in a pod. And we would have many pods, 20, 30, 40, depending on where in the country you were or where around the globe you are, um, pods in a data center. and each pod is that entire infrastructure. And so that might consist of 25 systems, 25 computers that makes a pod. So the test P, which is what we had as a test environment, was a scaled down version of that. So the test P was 10 systems, 10 computers, smaller in scale, but still the same hardware. So if, it, if you had an HP doing a certain service, we still had an HP. It was just a little less RAM, a little less hard, a little less disk, a little less CPU, because we're just doing a test. We're not we're not putting you know ten thousand members on it. We're going to put a hundred, you know, we're that sort of thing. So we just had to scale down environment. So we called it the test P because it was a PPUB. Um, that was that was the internal joke. Uh, so in the test P, one of the things, one of the checkoffs that you had to pass was you had to pass a certain number of security checks, and they involved things like all of the typical syntax input checks. You know, if you're expecting an email address, if I put something in there that doesn't have an at sign or I put something in there that doesn't have a period, you know, does it does it pass the syntax? If I just put a screen name and no at some, you know, AOL.com, does it pass? If I put Ursi at Yahoo.com, does it let me log in or does it not? You know, what what is it expecting? Making sure that, that you have all of those integrity checks throughout the whole series of pieces of the service. So if you've got an input, does it pass the input? Does it, you know, as we got, is we're starting to get to this point, we're starting to work with things like SQL injection. We're starting to work with input you know, injections into the, into the URL. We're starting to work with injections and buffer overflows and stuff like that. So this is what we did a lot of in the test P with our information security testing in the test P. Um, we had a suite of tests that we ran. They were all, internally homegrown this was prior to getting a hold of any compiled tests uh, this was before really red hat even had become popular and so you know like red hat has its own test suites that it's built in from the government security auditing processes that kind of people run now kind of across the board but it was prior to all of that so everything we were doing was pretty much homegrown and so there were a couple of people in the company that we would kind of get together periodically kind of off to the side away from the test P and just sit there and say, okay, you know, we're doing this, we're checking passwords, we're doing this, we're checking all the inputs in this, we're doing this, we're checking for what's going on with these fields, but we're, we don't have any way to check backend data to see if the backend data is corrupted. So how do we check? And so we start drilling into that. And a lot of my focus at that point was just making sure that all those checks were being taken care of. Um, I was moving a little bit away from the information security technologically and moving more into the information security management aspect. So that's when I was starting to, to bend a little bit toward the management side of the house at this point. So I was working on making sure that the, the checks were being done, making sure the re results were being recorded, uh, anything that failed, making sure it was being recorded, why it failed and how it was being resolved. And so that was where I was starting to bend at that point so uh so the, you're talking about the integrity of the data when, once it arrived um uh, yeah the integrity of the data once it arrived into the system i'm thinking in terms of like the input checks 
So you were saying like an email address that was lacking an at symbol. Was that like a client side check or was it also a server side check as well? Both. It could be both. If the if the client typed in, did the server send it correctly? You know, did did the developer develop their code properly? You know, if the code was supposed to strip it out, did it get stripped out properly? You know, you, you really you needed to check from from you know A through Z in a process um, because if if you sent it in in one form, but the end result it needed to be in a different form, was it converted properly? You know, if it came in in all caps from a PC, but Linux or Unix is case sensitive, and in the Unix database it's all in lowercase, it's not going to match. So at some point it needs to be lowercase. So what do you do? When does that happen? You know, how how soon does that happen, and and it, at what point is it a must happen, or else you don't have a match? You know, that sort of thing. So. Um, so we spent, especially in, in the test P group, we got to know a whole bunch of the different components of the company and a whole bunch of the different development teams because you would find really weird little problems, you know, things that, you know, especially stuff that developers like, but I never wrote that code. That code's been there for five years. I'm like, oh, it's wrong now. You know, <laughs> so they'd have to go find somebody to fix it because they just, it had never failed until they wrote this new module and suddenly it was failing. <laughs> it's like, you know, you have to deal with, you have to deal with the cascade of, of change. And so there was a lot of, a lot of that would happen. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's technical deck because turnover and stuff. Mm -hmm. right? So I guess I was wondering, did you ever have like security incidents that then caused you to update your test plan? Uh, like basically, you know, you you remediate it. Let's say it's like a SQL injection or, or whatever buffer overflow, and then you're like, okay, well now we need to update and test for this at every release because this happened or you know that happened. Um, thankfully, the majority of the security incidents that I've been involved with have been post AOL. Well. Um, so that, uh, and the reason I say thankfully is I think that the security incident model has matured significantly since leaving AOL. Well. I think that had things like Heartbleed or the Log4J issues, I think if those things had been happening in the 2000, early 2000s, we'd still be scrambling. You know, we'd still really not know what's going on. Because the, the depth of information that's had to be recorded and tracked down and, and just repeatedly gone back and gone back and gone back, especially like in my current job with Log4J, I've got customers who are like, they're not looking. I can reload that Docker that had that log4j in it. And the next day, it's like, nope, you got it there. You got to delete it again. You know, it's like constantly having to do that. And if you're not on the ball and on top of these things, you know, these these problems can just pop back up. And in a service where we had, you know, 5, 10, 25, 30 million customers, um, and there are there are people who can can find a way to manipulate the system or manipulate a user another user's PC, you know, which is really more of the threat, I think, than necessarily manipulating the AOL service itself, but manipulate another user's PC to do something that then compromises their computer and compromises their stuff, and then their recourse is to say it's AOL's fault. Then we have to justify how it's not, and that it, it's more in that case, it becomes more of a, a time consuming, you know, how do we help the customer get out of the situation they're in because we're good citizens and, and we're going to help them even if it's not our data specifically because it's our data collaterally. Um, and so that becomes, that would, would at this point that I think, like I said, I don't think we'd have survived some of these things. I mean, we did have some of the early worms and stuff like that that did hit, but it wasn't, you know, thankfully it didn't hit the internal architecture. So customers would blame AOL if they got a virus or something? Um, there are a lot of people out there who don't understand, especially back then, didn't understand computers. You know, the running joke is, you know, I don't know what's going on. My cup holder is broken. Um, 
that was serious. People were calling because they didn't understand what their, their CD tray was for. Um, they did not know really what they had. They had computers and they weren't using them properly. Um, my, you know, to this day, my ex mother-in-law will routinely call or my aunts will routinely call and say, my computer's running slow. <laughs> what kills me is my aunt's on a Mac. So I don't know how she manages to do this. <laughs> It's like it's a call, and it's like, okay, how did this get so difficult? I mean, you've been using a computer now for over twenty years. How is it you still don't understand? But it's a generational thing. I mean, the, you know, the, the baby boomers are growing up and growing old, so they're they're kind of passing away. But still, there's a generation that's having trouble really connecting to the technology and we hit the early edge of that generation as the older edge of our customers and have ridden that wave the entire time. And so they've always been, you know, the, the parents or the grandparents of all of our customers. And I have a funny story from when I was working in games, I was working on a, a game called Slingo, which was a combination of slots and bingo, very addictive game, actually very simple, very easy but very addictive, um, kind of like a lot of the simple puzzle games that are out now. But you could, at first, you would just play with random people, but then they made a modification to the game, and you could set up a room, and you could play with selective people, and you could select the people that you played with. And so all of a sudden, it was, you know, grandma and granddaughter, or aunt and nephew, or you know, mother and son, and these people would be playing. And then if the game went down, literally all hell would break loose. And my customer would get bombarded with nasty messages and messages with curse words that you don't expect to hear from a grandma about how you've just ruined their day because you've broken their communication with their granddaughter or cut them off in the middle of a chat with their, their nephew while they were playing this game. And how dare you take their effing time away? Um, and it was just, I, I, honestly, I didn't believe them until one day I actually had to ticket in with, with my network operations team to take out the old server, I'd, I'd migrated them over to a new server, more high power, more disk space. Everything was great. That server was on the upper half of a rack. Their old server was in the lower half of the rack. And I'd put a ticket in to have the server in the lower half of the rack decommissioned, taken out of the rack and taken to the back so that HP could decommission it. About two o'clock in the afternoon, my phone starts ringing. Pick it up. It's the customer. They're like, What's the matter? I'm like, what do you mean? What's the matter? And I'm like, something's happened to the system. I am getting bombarded by customers. The system's down. So the first thing I do is I try to ping the computer and it's not responding. And I said, I will get right back to you. So I hung up on him. I tried to ping it one more time and I ran downstairs. Luckily at that time, both the computer and the network operations center were downstairs in, in my building. I ran downstairs. I went to the desk that supported me. And I said, we need to find this computer. It's offline. And so we went out to the floor, to the floor tile that it was supposed to be sitting on. It was empty. So then we went back and tried to find out what happened, <laughs> found that the hardware support staff had misread the ticket. And instead of just removing the server, they removed the rack. They unplugged the whole thing and wheeled it out into the hallway. So we pulled it back into the room, plugged it back in, and thankfully it came back online. Did a whole lot of checking and whatever. Managed to get it back online, managed to get the game started again, contacted the customer, explained, may have culped, uh, you know, apologized for you know me and everybody that it had happened and I said but I still can't believe that you know you were sweared at by you know grannies 
so he sent me a couple examples. You know, took the screen names off, but he sent me the text of these messages. These little old ladies were f bombing this guy right, left, and sideways. I mean, wow. The the emotions that you know they were putting into this, and and it was very much a generational thing. And I think you know, so obviously some people get it, but there were a whole lot that still didn't. And you know, it's it was just it was it was that was I think one of the most stressful and most fun days because I got to read customer mail that was shocking. <laughs> was Stingo free? Yes, Stingo was free. And they were that mad about it, about a free service? Oh, yeah. They were, anytime anytime I had to schedule an outage, like if I had to do patching that required rebooting the box, I had to give them two weeks notice. I had to post a notice, a notice board on the game that like sat on the top line banner for a week. With you know, it's going to be down from you know 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern, such and such a date. You know, it's like we had to these. I mean, and I mean, it was courtesy for the customers, you know, but there was no, there was no guarantee. There was nothing that said you know this game's going to be up 24 seven three you know 365. It was just you know I was doing it because the customer was a cool guy and he was really nice about it. And, you know, it was just being nice to him, but it was just so funny it was so funny and and yeah they were that hot about the game not being available interesting what what other games did you support over at AOL everything that was on the system that wasn't a mud what's a mud Uh, multi-user dungeon I don't think we really had a mud but we had a couple multi-user games um but we had I can't think I can't really remember a lot of the names anymore. Neverwinter Nights. Oh yeah, yeah, we had that one. We had one that was short lived. That was a lot of fun. It was a, a spaceship chase game. It wasn't like Galaga. It was like a more more three dimensional. Um, my coworkers were constantly asking me to give them cheat codes. <laughs> I was like, I don't have one for myself. How can I give you one? <laughs> So that's funny. You know, the, yeah. the, the folks at the real re AOL project, they got single working again. Oh, they did. Oh, I'm going to have to go find it. I love that game. Yeah. I was playing it the other day. Yeah. It was good. I love that game. Yeah. The guys, they actually, as a one day, so this is back when you could actually give gifts. They sent me one holiday season. They sent me this huge gift basket with like fruit and a t-shirt and a little battery-operated Slingo, a little handheld Slingo. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't know they made this. That's cool. I, I I, didn't either until I got it, and I kept it for years and years and years. It finally finally died, and it would no longer play. <laughs> Do you still have it, the broken one? No. No. It's probably worth money, but no, I don't have it. Not, it, it got lost somewhere in one of my moves. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, no, I love that game. God, it was so much fun. <laughs> That's really cool. So you had mentioned before another episode about some of the mm-hmm. folks who were trying to hack AOL and then and then hiring them, like flipping them. Um, I wasn't directly involved with any of that, but most of the ones that that I know just as as acquaintances, they were brought in predominantly then as developers because they the ones that we did and the one who was. Jay Levitt was just brilliant. He came in as a kid. I mean, the kid, like 17, 18. I mean, he was just brilliant. He, it's really hard to say anything about him other than, you know, he just, you, you had a question about coding, you just went to Jay. I mean, he's just so smart. Now, the people that really hunted him down and, and then would, would go to flip them, Jan really was more involved in that and, and Craig. But and if you if you could ever get a hold of him, Jeff Bushy, who was my boss in the security days, he's a bit secretive these days. But um, now I wish I had more for that. Sorry. No worries. So you went from starting out doing web server administration, and then evolved into the mail servers, and then it got more more narrowed with the mail servers, right? Like incoming. And then you said you got mm-hmm. kind of on the security testing side where you test the inputs 
and then it moved to the kind of like project management side of it. Is that right? Yeah. From security, I went, there was a, a great need then for project management. And I was already going for my PMP in the security team. So I went ahead and finished. And then the the company was basically snapping up every PMP that, that was being produced and spreading them around the company. So I went to a de- the development side of the house uh, with my PMP and took the information security knowledge that I had and used that to help influence the project development and to integrate more testing into project development. The one thing that I think that I like a lot about the career I've had is that because I started in operations and I went into information security and then I went into project management, focused on the dev side, and then I've kind of swung back into operations is I've kind of seen, and I've done some QA at, at other places, I've kind of seen the whole production cycle associated with, you know, getting a piece of code from concept to deployment. So I, I kind of know the different points where you have to kind of stop and think and say, hey, does this still work? Does, you know, we've, we've developed it. We need to test it. Okay, we've tested it. We need to send it to QA. Does QA still pass it? Nope, there's something wrong. So we have to send it back. And we need to test it again. Send it to QA. Does QA pass it? Yes. Okay, now we need to send it to a test deployment facility. Does it deploy in test? Yes. Okay, great. Now we can deploy to production. Does it deploy in test? No. Okay, what do we have to do to fix it? Take it all the way back to dev or just take it back one step? You know, it's like you really, it's, it's so helpful to know because so many times you'll, you'll meet a project manager who's just gone through a project management career. They've never done anything operational. They've never done anything QA. They've never done really anything but like the development life cycle. So all they know is that a developer is going to tell them, yeah, it's going to take me four weeks to develop that. The developer, unless they're really pushed to test, unless they're really pushed to QA their code, they're not going to add that extra time that's necessary. Um, they're going to say, okay, I've written it. It's got out the door. I'm done. I'm going to move on to the next thing. Um, they're, they're not going to want to go back and revisit what they've done. So having the extra experience to know that, okay, if you, you're telling me four weeks, I'm going to pad at least two more weeks onto that because I'm going to make you revisit this if for no other reason that I want to make sure it deploys. You know, and I, I'm going to guarantee you a QA person to find at least one thing wrong. You know, if you're that good a coder that there's nothing wrong with it, I'm still going to want it to be checked again because I don't believe it. You know? It's like, I don't think anybody can write perfect code. So, you know, it's, it's it's the experience that I've gained and the knowledge that I have from how long it truly takes to get something from development into production is something that I think not everybody in my position has. And I think that's been biggest benefit I've gained from taking the career path that I did. Yeah, definitely. It's it's always super helpful to have a like a technical project manager that actually knows what's going on and mm-hmm. holds people accountable. Yep. So after you left AOL, I know later you got some certifications and stuff. Did you stick with security um, or more on the project management route? Um, I pretty quickly went right back into systems administration with, I've always kind of hung a security door knocker on my, on my uh, resume. Security, like kind of like I was saying toward the beginning, now more of the jobs these days and more of the, the graduates these days are coming out with very focused careers. So if you're coming out, you're coming out with a security or an IT security degree. Um, so a lot of the, the real quote security jobs are going to people with those degrees. So a lot of what I have for information security is homegrown knowledge, is knowledge from you know, coalescing all of the information that I've learned over the years. Um, and the couple of certifications that I do have and, the, and the, the hope that somebody will give me enough time to actually finish a couple of the certifications I've been trying to get for the past couple of years. Um, so it's more that I have an extreme interest in security and I always will and I always have. 
and that anytime anybody gives me an opportunity at a job to do it, I will do it. Um, but it's not an official part of my job title. I've wanted to become a security, I guess, security officer. I guess that's what they call a lot of the the people these days. Um, an information security officer. I've wanted to be a. I've always wanted to be a red hat. I've always wanted to be the bad guy. Um, but um, I've done a lot of of the blue hat, a lot of the defending. So I've always wanted to to become one of the offending people, just because it's a different side of the house. Starting pretty much as soon as I left AOL, I jumped back into the government. And the first thing you start dealing with as soon as you get into an IT job with the government is, you know, even at the lowest level, simple things like firewalls, simple things like how do you get information in and out of a system? You know, you don't necessarily think of that as information security, but it is. It's low level. It's not, you know, heavy duty security applications. But, you know, when somebody says, well, I can't get data from my computer to, to the computer down the street, there's something blocking it. So you've got to deal with the security problems that are there. Or when you realize that you can get from your computer to the computer down the street and you shouldn't be able to, you've got to deal with that. So it's been, it's been an active part of my career ever since. You had mentioned some security incidents um, after leaving AOL. Mm-hmm. Are you able to talk about any of those? Um. I can talk about them in in, in generalities. Um, yeah, that's yeah. fine. I don't I don't need like specific yeah. company names or anything. Um, you know, we a lot of a lot of the incidents will get a notification either through official channels like uh, the cert board or an email notification from a senior leader, or senior IT person. Depending on if you're in a twenty four by seven shop, who's up first? If you're Responsive, the responsible party, like in my current job, I'm the responsible party. So I keep an eye on on like what Red Hat's producing as far as their their messaging, and I keep an eye on what the uh, agency security team sends out to read to make sure that it applies or doesn't apply to our systems. And then you you act upon what they say. So if it's if it's a major incident like the Heartbleed or this current um, Java problem that's going on, you deal with the immediate issues of what systems are affected. So you, different vendors have different uh, protocols for dealing with it. Different agencies have different protocols for dealing with it. There have been some incidents that have required just taking a service offline. There have been solar winds. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Feel free to interject. <laughs> there have been some that are, I wouldn't necessarily say optional, but they're not, they're the sort of thing where it's an informational problem. You know, it's like, you know, be aware that, that this has the potential of causing a, a opening to your system over this particular port or portal. Um, you know, under under this very specific, very well defined, but now publicly defined condition. Um, so you know, and I, and I think by publicly defining it, everything becomes much more vulnerable. So as soon as things like you know DISA or uh, CERT or those organizations start publishing the information, everything is a vulnerability at that point. I think even if they say it's not necessarily a truly system crashing vulnerability, it still becomes one. Have you always been in a situation where you knew all the systems and what they were like and had a configuration like management database? Or is it sometimes you get asked a question and you're like, well, I have no idea because we actually don't have an inventory of our systems. <laughs> My current job, we are still processing through everything. We're in for the federal government, they they do this thing called an ATO or an authorization to operate, and we're in the process of doing our ATOs for the for the will be next fiscal year. So we're doing it for November, and to do the ATO, you have to pass the STIG or the, the security check checklists that DISA puts out, and we've got some systems we're passing just fine. We've got other systems. 
I don't think we're even touching because I walk past them in the data center and I don't see them in our inventory list. I keep checking and I keep asking, but I get no answer. So, and I don't have a login on them. So they're either not our systems or they're not currently known. And that's worrisome to me. Um, but I'll, I'll be honest, I'm leaving them for last because, you know, we've got, we'll get the, the, the 80, 20 rule and we get the 80% done and then I'll deal with the 20% that I, that I can't address. Um, because once the 80% is done, that, that, that 20 will be much easier to handle. But yeah, I don't think there's ever been a job where I've been a hundred percent in the know, even at AOL, there's always been a risk of being not 100% in the know, but at AOL, I think that was probably the most comprehensive because there were people whose job it was to be responsible for the data centers. Their job was to walk up and down those floors, make sure computers were on, make sure they were labeled, make sure they were cabled, make sure everything had a rack and row and elevation and was charted in a tool and you know they weren't great tools back then they were probably just spreadsheets but they were they were identified and right now that is, doesn't exist for me in my current position um we've got one team that has a great tool makes these great graphical charts but you can't print from it and my team doesn't have edit, edit rights so we can't add any data to it so i have to make a spreadsheet to go parallel with it that I can print. So I still have two tools that I'm using. So it's, you know, it's, it's not as ideal as it could be. Um, Definitely. Yeah. It's, it's that I think that that's one other drawback. And I think some of that more between commercial versus government, not necessarily a well versus government is there's a stronger sense of fiefdom in the government. So the, the team that does manage the data centers, that's their world. That's their fief. You can't get in there other than to do your little part, which is to like rack the computer and power it on. But they're going to be the ones that control the elevation chart. So you can rack it, you can power it on, and then you go back to your desk and you do whatever you need to do from your desk. Don't don't go mucking around with anything else. You know, don't don't touch anything else. Um, yet at the same time. You know, I would love if I could help them by filling out the rest of the data so that they had a complete representation in their tool. And it would help me because then I would only have to go to one tool to get all the information. So um, six of one, half dozen. It is what it is. Right. Yeah. So can you tell me about why you decided to go for it and obtain the Security Plus and Certified Ethical Hacker certifications? <laughs> Security Plus is a requirement of the government. Um, I would not have gone for that. It's a windows based security certification. Um, it has very little to do with Linux. They do have a separate one called security plus Linux, which probably isn't a whole lot better. I'm not a fan of the company that puts out those audits or those uh, tests. Now CEH as certified ethical hacker, that's part of a larger program that will get you down a rabbit hole of some deep, dark hacking technology. And that's kind of one of the first steps. So that's why I went for that. It, it's also in and of itself a fairly lightweight test or, or program, but it's, it, it starts to get into some of the, the ethics, in particular the ethics of hacking and, and the difference between being, you know, a, a good guy versus a bad guy versus kind of a neutral person. Um, and it's, it's more focused on, you know, where do you want to take your abilities and your, and what tools, what tools do you want to use? Do you want to use tools that just test the environment or do you want to use tools that break the environment? So. Yeah. That's always tricky when you're tuning your vulnerability scanner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you really want to use Nmap to crash the network, or do you just want to use Nmap to scan the network? <laughs> so, can you tell me about Girls Who Code? Girls Who Code. 
Um, Girls Who Code is a wonderful organization. It's a not-for-profit that works nationwide, actually, maybe globally, but nationwide for sure. They form clubs in high schools and some middle schools, typically in less privileged neighborhoods, to bring in mentors, uh, folks like myself, usually women, but they will take uh, male mentors as well, to is to lead after school clubs, usually two hours, one night a week, to teach the kids kind of anything they want to learn about computing. Um, they have a prescribed curriculum, but you don't have to follow it. I never did follow it the first couple times. I did it. I kind of read through the curriculum and tried to follow a little bit, but the school that I was teaching at, the kids were a little more advanced. Um, the curriculum is pretty, pretty basic. It's, it's starts you off with, with block coding with a graphical tool. And, and these girls were already doing uh, Java and Python. So we just jumped right in. In the last year that I was working with them, we were taking apart the old laptops and putting in new RAM and new hard drives and bringing the old laptops back to life. So <laughs> that's really fun. So it's, it, yeah, it was fun. It was fun. It was freaking them out. It's like, no, you really you push with both thumbs and the RAM comes up and they were like, I'm breaking it. And I'm like, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to expose the, the girls to the career field and you get to, you know, I would basically just tell them all these different anecdotes and tell them what my day was like. And they were just fascinated by what my day was like. Um, so, you know, they listen to me complain about somebody at work or they listen to the challenge that I had. And so, you know, I'd talk for 10 or 15 minutes and then we'd pick something to do or pick an assignment from, from the program and, and do something. Um, my girls, uh, continually, uh, won prizes for the different projects they did, uh, one year, actually two years in a row, uh, we live here in the Washington, D.C. metro area, and Volkswagen Audi has a headquarters here, and they have a software challenge every year. And one year, their software challenge was focused not at actually writing code, but at coming up with concepts for either uh, code to be written for their new e-tron car or physical projects to be developed for the e-tron car. And my girls chose the code process, code project, and they black boxed outlined some projects that they think would be good for the e-tron as far as having, you know, a, a button on the, on the dashboard that would immediately turn the radio off. That wasn't like a, a dial, but like would, would mute it for like 10 seconds so that the parent could say something and then it would come back on to have, you know, a way to like mute the, the TV screens in the back seat so that the parent could talk over the kids. You know, they came up with like 20 or 30 different things and just, you know, kind of just wrote them out, gave them some outlines, you know, said, if driver does this, something else does that. If passenger does this, something else does that. They, they came up with these different steps and they actually won and they won $2,000 Oh, cool! Um, as a club. And so we went and bought iPads for all of them. So they, they did reap the rewards for, for coming up with really good ideas. And the next year, the club got invited again to compete. So That's really cool. I found it incredibly rewarding. I did it for five years. I, I felt like a mom. My, fr my first group of freshmen graduated in my fourth year, and it was all very weepy, and it was fun. And, um, I was very proud of them, and I've kept in touch. I've got uh, girls at Stanford, George Mason, Columbia, Virginia Tech. Um, and these are brilliant kids. They're just, they're just really smart. And they've all, for the most part, either gone into mathematics or computers. So That's really cool. Yeah, it is. What advice would you give to girls that might be interested in a career in IT? Don't be afraid. It's not a boys field anymore. Don't let anybody tell you that math is for boys, math is for girls, math is for anybody. It's not hard. It really isn't. Math is fun. I love math. Math. I have a math minor. I would just 
so much fun. Don't let anybody stop you. Did you face any challenges in the IT field? Yes, I still do. <laughs> it's it's always been tough being, especially early on, in the 90s mostly, I think. It was very hard being a woman in IT because there was a lot of, of stereotyping about women in math and women in in technology, just not being as smart, not being as savvy. One of the reasons that did start to motivate me to look for a reason to leave my government job, I got into a heated battle with the lady who was my boss at the time. We had a a Sun server. That's how how old it was. It was a Sun server. And we needed to load Sun OS on the Sun server. We had a guy who was scheduled to take the training to load the Sun OS on the Sun server in two months. The Sun server was overdue to be delivered to the customer, another government customer. So again, speed of government. And I said, let me do it. I, I want to learn. Let me do it. And she said, well, you'll break it. And I'm like, well, I can't physically break it. We'll just reinstall it. You know, if I don't install it right, we'll just reinstall it. And she's like, well, you cannot ask anyone for help about anything. I'm like, okay, fine. So I went and took the manual and I started reading the manual. And it was a pretty straightforward install, you know. Install disk one, install disk two, install disk three. So I did all of that and I got to the last disk and it was asking for the IP address. Well, I didn't know the IP address. And so I went to my team lead and I said, could I have the IP address for the server? And he gave it to me and my boss blew up in my face. She was, she's like, you were not allowed to ask anyone for anything. Wow. And she just chewed me up one side and down the other. Wow. I'm like, the guy who was going to training wouldn't have known that either. I'm sorry. You know, that's he wouldn't he wouldn't have had that information either. Thankfully my my boss has male defended me, but I mean she tore me into one. And I'm just like, I don't want your job, you know, I don't want to be you. I but I don't know why she was so worried. You know, but I built it right. You know, I put it I put it in the IP and poof it was working. <laughs> Why wouldn't she want you to ask for help? The only thing I think of looking back, looking in in hindsight, is that she felt threatened because I was another woman in IT. And, you know, certainly back in the 90s, it was quotas. You know, so many women, so many this, so many that. She was Hispanic and a woman. I was a white woman. We were the only women. So, you know, there there was some level of, you know, we're, we're a percentage, and there has to be so much of a percentage in the department or else. Um, but you know, I was new. I was only you know three years at the agency. I certainly wasn't anywhere near ranked enough to, to get promoted to management. I have no idea. I really don't. Interesting. That that's uh, I, I could definitely see mm-hmm. that making me want to leave. That just seem, it just seems ridiculous. It was, it was, it was utterly ridiculous. And it, it really, yeah, I mean, she threw me under a bus for no reason. Well, I guess maybe looking at something a little bit happier. <laughs> what is some of the best advice you ever received? Well, one of the best pieces of advice I received was to become a Girls for Code mentor. While I was working, I was working at Akamai at the time. And one of my coworkers walked in and said, you should do this. You're perfect for this job. You should, you're for the, for this group, you should go do this. And it was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. And actually that same person, he's, uh, his name's Kevin. He said to me, decide now whether you're going to be a generalist or a specialist and stick with it. Now, it was fairly, I'll say it was about the middle of my career when he gave me this advice. 
And I've decided and I'm glad that I did to be a generalist. I like learning everything, forgetting half of it, relearning it, forgetting another half of it, relearning something new, but always knowing that somewhere in some recess in my brain, I've seen that before. And that because I have, I can learn it again. So that, you know, if somebody says, well, we need you to go touch a Cisco fire, you know, Cisco firewall or a Cisco switch or a Cisco this or a, a the Apache web server or a Solaris server or whatever. It's like, yeah, I have, may not have done that in six years, but I know where to start. You know, I, I got a place that I can go to, to, to find the beginning. And from there I can go. And I like being, I had, I had a friend yesterday tell me, you're brilliant. You know that, right? <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not, but thank you. I just, I've got a ton of trivia in my head. A good portion of it's IT trivia. Um, but, you know, it's all jumbled up in there and, and it comes out sometimes in the right order and sometimes not. And I think that's, that kind of advice, the generalist advice makes it makes it fun. And then it's fun to sort through all that trivia and find what I need when I need it. Yeah, definitely. What are some of your passion projects? Um, none of them are IT related. That's fine. <laughs> um, ballroom dancing. And um, just getting back into D and D for the first time in way too many years. <laughs> I love I love RPGs, so I'm getting back into an RPG. Um, and um, this is kind of personal. I'm I'm dating. I'm in love. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so that's a project. <laughs> Do you have any parting words of wisdom? Don't be afraid. Don't let anybody tell you you can't. One of the first people I worked with in this field was deaf. Wow. So, yeah. And one of my coworkers at AOL was blind. So. Wow. He was an amazing guitar player and coder. <laughs> He's a coder? Yeah. Fastest touch typer in the West. <laughs> How's that work if you're, if you're blind? Oh, it would, it would read back to him through, what is it, Dragon software? Oh, Dragon Naturally Speaking or whatever? Yeah. Well, it was whatever it was named. It was Dragon something back then. I, I think it's Naturally Speaking now. But yeah, he would just type it, type it, type it, type it. And then it would just go, blah, 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 And he'd you know, go up three lines, change a letter, come back down. And yeah, brilliant database coder. That's really interesting. Sweetest, see, sweetest seeing eye dog on the planet. Yeah, he would let the dog go. The dog would just wander around the building until... You know, he was bored or whatever. <laughs> Do you remember the dog's name? No, I wish I did. I wish I did. Interesting. Is there anything else uh, you wanted to share today? No. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Again, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. No, this was great. Hack the planet! Hack the planet! Welcome to cyberspace.